Biden teases an AI executive order, scientists share their feelings about AI, and ChatGPT with Browse is back. Welcome back to the AI Breakdown Brief, all the AI headline news you need in around five minutes. One of the most anticipated features that ChatGPT launched this year was the ability to browse the internet to better answer queries. Now, up until that point, ChatGPT had a knowledge cutoff in late 2021, after which it simply didn't know things. So if you were asking or prompting ChatGPT for information about something that related to anything that had changed in the last two years, you were kind of out of luck. Browsing the internet obviously gave ChatGPT new capabilities, and frankly in some ways was required as a feature parity kind of thing, given that Bard and Bing AIs had both integrated that feature right from the get-go. Now, that said, at some point along the way, people figured out that they could use ChatGPT's browse tools to get around paywalls. That created some fairly significant legal risks for OpenAI, and so for a good amount of time, ChatGPT browse has been turned off. Now, as Sam Altman puts it, we are so back. OpenAI tweets, ChatGPT can now browse the internet to provide you with current and authoritative information complete with direct links to sources. It is no longer limited to data before September 2021. The updates, they say, include identifying user agents so sites can control how ChatGPT interacts with them. Now, as for right now, Browse is only available to Plus and Enterprise users, but it'll be expanding out to all users soon. And for those who sign into their Plus account and are wondering where it is, you have to go over to Settings into Beta Features and enable Browse with Bing before you have access to it. It's the same place that you turn on plugins. Now, from a sheer utility perspective, this is obviously a welcome return, and I'm sure that it has absolutely nothing to do with the timing of Meta's Connect event, at which, as we will hear, they announced that AI was basically going to live everywhere that Meta does, from Instagram to Messenger to Facebook to WhatsApp and beyond. Now, in a world where AI lives everywhere, of course, there need to be probably some new guardrails, perhaps new regulations. Right now in D.C., there are so many different groups clamoring to give their input on how to regulate this new technology field, or why not to. We've had numerous proposals from different groups of bipartisan senators, even preemptive proposals meant to get ahead of what people see as forthcoming legislation that hasn't been introduced yet. The White House is, of course, in that mix. For the past several months, they've been engaging with executives, as well as civil rights and other types of thought leaders who have input on the opportunities and the challenges of the industry and it appears that an executive order from the Biden administration is forthcoming. Now, it's not that we didn't know that there was going to be an EO. The White House basically announced that back in July. What's more, we don't really know what the contents are going to be. During a meeting of the Presidential Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, President Biden repeated the same sort of it has great possibilities and also great dangers language that we've heard throughout from his administration. And so really the only new information is that it appears that this EO is coming in a matter of weeks, not a matter of months. A last note from this meeting is that as part of it, that panel of advisors showcased to Biden a number of different use cases that were positive for AI, such as using it to predict extreme weather, using AI to, quote, create materials that have properties we've never been able to create before, and to, quote, understand the origins of the universe, which is literally as big as it gets. Now, moving back to the world of actual AI products and startups, one buzzy company called Mistral earlier this year raised a $113 million seed round. Now, this got tongues wagging and bubble accusations flowing because, again, I'm talking about a nine-figure seed round. But people who know the individuals involved in their background at companies like Meta and Google DeepMind said it wasn't as crazy as it seemed. Well, that company has released its first model, Mistral 7B. And as TechCrunch puts it, the model was released under the Apache 2.0 license, a highly permissive scheme that has no restrictions on use or reproduction beyond attribution. Now, many pointed out that at least on first glance, the Mistral LLM looked really promising. The 7B model actually outperformed Meta's Llama 2 13B across a variety of benchmarks. Now, over in the world of entertainment, where everyone is trying to figure out the implications of the tentative agreement between the studios and writers, a new report from consulting giant Bain & Co. has suggested that Hollywood should, instead of replacing those creatives, use AI to reduce costs in other areas. The report is called Tech in Content Production, Will AI Kill the Video Star? And the subtitle said it might help them. The report writes that when it comes to using AI to replace writers or actors or visual artists, quote, studios should spurn that path. Instead, the report says, quote, they can use technology to reduce budgets by pulling more of the production process up front and streamlining production and post-production. The savings will enable studios to make more quality content for less. By way of example, they say, think more usable minutes per day of filming and doing half your visual effects in pre-production. That means movies hit theaters or streaming platforms months earlier, some with a 20% reduction in budget or more. 
Now, I think this is a really sensible evolution of the conversation. By treating AI like a binary when it comes to the entertainment industry, you just calcify each side of the conversation. What Bain is pointing out is that even the incredibly cost and profit conscious studios can still be leaning into the benefits of AI without undermining the core creatives that make their industry run. It's a really interesting report. It even goes into examples of how it could see cost savings in practice. And I think more than anything else, it reflects an evolution of the conversation where we've moved from this being all theoretical to this being theoretical but applied to contractual negotiations, as in the case of this strike, to being highly practical and specific and able to actually be put into models that help businesses understand how AI can save them time and money. Lastly today, another survey around AI attitudes, but this time it's a nature survey asking 1600 research scientists what they think. Now, a couple things that make this more interesting to me than perhaps some of the other surveys that we've gone over in the past. One, in general, you have to assume that this is a slightly more informed group. And because of that, what you see is definitely more nuance and specificity in both their concerns and their understanding of positive aspects. These researchers, for example, are extremely excited about AI helping them process data more quickly. More than 50% are excited about it saving researchers time and money. Almost 70% are excited about it providing faster ways to process data. Now, similarly, when it comes to the negative impacts, the fears are more precise as well. Around 69% are worried that it will lead to more reliance on pattern recognition without understanding, basically scientists becoming over-reliant on AI. Concerns like entrenching bias or discrimination and making fraud easier also had more than 50% of these respondents concerned. Another really interesting benefit of generative AI specifically, more than 50% of respondents said that they liked that it helped researchers without English as a first language. We've talked a lot on this show about how breaking down linguistic barriers seems to be one of the areas that AI will disrupt first. Now, lastly, in a sign of just how early things remain, when asked how they used large language models currently, between 20 and 30% said things like to help write research manuscripts, to help do research, to conduct literature reviews, to brainstorm research ideas. But by far the most common response with over 40% was for creative fun not related to my research. And I think that this is really common. Right now, what you're seeing is a ton of people across basically every industry in the world experimenting with ChatGPT or MidJourney or whatever tool it is, just for themselves, for the joy of it, for the interest of it, for the excitement of it, and then starting to have ideas about how they might apply it to their work or their research or their school or whatever context they find themselves in. Those people become the early adopters and their case studies of how they use it become the templates for other people who are doing similar work to them. And that's why this is spreading so fast. Overall, I think it's positive to see a more nuanced survey, although I will say it doesn't seem like this got deep into any of the big questions of risk, and I would certainly be interested to see what this set of scientists have to say about that. However, for now, that is going to do it for today's AI Breakdown Brief. I'll be back soon with the main AI Breakdown.